sponsored by the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and by the College of Music with the generous support of the Center for American Ideals and Culture. Uh, the origin of this event is, is, is uh, actually fairly interesting because I've been, it, it goes along with the seminar on Goya that I'm teaching right now. I've been, I've been negotiating with humanity seminars as a member of the board. You're going to do it this year, you're going to do it next year. So we eventually said it. And then last, in the spring of 2009, I was at my son's uh, master's recital in music at Yale. And he said, well, you're coming out a day early. Go to the new music uh, symposium concerts there every Friday. And this one won't be so bad because it's not all students. They're doing all work by a professor. So I went, and I was taken by the fact that I opened the program, and there was a piece by Martin Bresnik on Goya. I said, wow, this sounds really interesting. So <clears throat> from that point on, I had it in my mind to bring uh, Professor Bresnik out here to speak uh, in conjunction with the seminar. Uh, I, Martin Bresnik, but before I start, two announcements. One, I have to do the voice of God, which is uh, <coughs> turn your phone, cell phones off. Uh, two, this is percussion music. It's L O U D. Okay? Uh, and by design, there's nothing wrong with the sound system. It's loud. Okay? So I just want to. Uh, I had that experience at, uh, when we went to an Evelyn Wedding concert at the, here in Tucson. Uh, the first, we, she bought the first th three rows and, uh, after the first movement. So, uh, there, the, the music's coming through the sound system, so if it's too loud, move a little bit further away from the speakers. <clears throat> but it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Martin Bresnik, uh, Professor Bresnik, whose concerto we're going to stream today. He, we're going to stream the music with uh, the, uh, some of the caprichos uh, that we'll talk about in a minute, some of the disasters of war. Uh, is Professor of Composition at Yale. He has his uh, degrees from uh, the uh, Stanford and uh, the Academie de Musik in Vienna. Uh, he's taught all around the world. He has had, uh, he's been a Rome Prize uh, fellow. He's had several, uh, numerous uh, Fulbright fellowships and uh, he has uh, been visiting professor in a number of places. Professor Bresnik is a distinguished composer. Uh, his work has uh, appeared, uh, published by, uh, or recorded by, published, I guess, by Cannibal Records and, and others. He has uh, written film for music, uh, for music for films, <laughs> two of which, Arthur and Lily and The Day After Trinity, were nominated. We're delighted to have Professor Bresnik here uh, with us today. Uh, the piece about which he will be speaking is based on the last etchings of Francisco de Goya y Lucientes uh, Disasters of War. The last etchings of that series uh, are called the Caprichos and Fatigos. And without further ado, I'm going to get out of the way and introduce Martin Bresnik. Uh, first of all, let me just say something about loudness. Uh, it is loud, and it's going to be hard to avoid it. You think it's very loud, you can cover your ears if necessary. I don't think you will. You're young enough that it, you're used to it, or you're too old, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, and I'm in, you know, as Groucho Marx said, I resemble that. So uh, I, I don't think you're going to find it too difficult. Um, but you have to think about percussion music for just a moment. I mean, percussion music, its expressivity is a direct correlation with the way you strike the instrument. And percussionists like Malcolm's wonderful musician son, Michael, uh, know, and what they hate to be told is play soft, because you restrict 
their expressivity when you do that. No drum set player wants to be told to just play with brushes. Those instruments need to sound. And it, percussion is a wonderful visual uh, instrument in the sense that everything that they do, you can see them do. There's really not much hidden that happens in percussion music. So if somebody strikes something very strongly, you actually see the physical kinetic moment where they lift their arm and bring it down. These have to, that energy, that potential and finally kinetic energy is in every stroke. So there's something extremely theatrical about percussion music right from the get-go that's not necessarily true of piano players, for example, or trumpet players, whose magic is created in ways that are not always completely visual to you, to the audience. So when I received a commission from the wonderful Soul Percussion Quartet to make a piece for them and for the pianist Lisa Moore as a kind of piano concerto for percussion, <coughs> I realized that the environment of theater was going to be a natural outcome of what I was doing. Uh, theater was going to have to play a role. Um, and so I searched for something that, that meant something to me theatrically that I thought I could do something with. And I was looking, it was, it's been wartime for us in the States for, what, since 2002 or so? It's been a long, long and sad uh, experience for us. And it goes on, and it's not just for us, but in many parts of the world. And I was looking again at these wonderful etchings of Goya from the, from the Caprichos and finally the Disastros de, de la Guerra, the Disasters of War. And then again at the very dark ones at the end, the so-called caprichos emphaticos, emphatic caprices. It doesn't really quite capture what Goya was aiming at. But uh, these pictures are very dark and very disturbing, but they resonated with me. And I thought, there's something here. Maybe I could do something with this. Now, one of the caprichos is called, it's actually a little earlier in the book, it's called Farandula de Charlatanes. Uh, now, a farandula in modern Spanish parlance is a kind of a troupe of actors. Charlatanes, for us, has the cognate word for, in English speaking of charlatans. And there is something a little bit unsavory about these figures that Goya is representing, as you will soon see. But the word farandula struck a, struck a chord with me because it sounded like something I knew and I didn't know that I knew. And it turned out that my suspicions were correct, and rarely this is so, but this was really true. The word farandula is related very closely to the word farandol from the Provence. And a farandol is a dance, a chain dance, where people hold hands and dance to the village. It, it actually descended from an ancient Greek tradition, a kind of labyrinthine thing of coming out of the labyrinth in a chain of related individuals. And it would be sort of a boy-girl, boy-girl dance through the whole village with people joining on. And that's a farandol. And does anybody know a farandol in music? You do, but you don't know it. Okay, people know the Bizet La Lesienne suite. The last movement of that is called a farandol. And farandol, it's not surprising that this French composer who was talking about Arles writes a farandol, because Arles, after all, would be the place where you would find the provenance of these kinds of materials. Well, Goya's world, just across the Pyrenees, the word probably has the same relationship of chain of dancers. And I began to, as I looked at these Goya pictures, I thought more and more, there's something really here, there's a lot of chains here. No Saben El Camino is one of the little things that Goya wrote underneath one of the pictures. And there's a chain of, of, of figures all roped together, marching into a pit. And I thought of the great Aretha Franklin, and I thought, chain, chain, chain chain of fools. And in a sense, that's really the folk tradition, again, of the same tradition. There's a series of chains of people not doing the right thing. So I took some of these Goya, these Goya images and I used his words almost exclusively, but where I needed to add something, I made them farandulas. So you're going to see a farandula de politicos, not surprisingly. Uh, 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 a, a farandula de creyentes, in other words, a chain of the, the believers. You're going to see a number of things that I have added on to. 
And so the first movement of the work is called Farangola Simple, which means just, well, a simple farangola. And those of you who know, remember your Bach suites, probably raise your hand, Bach suites, anybody? Okay, the English suites in particular always have in them somewhere a saraban simple and a saraban duple, a double saraban. So my piece is framed, as you will soon hear, by that. You have a farangola simple and a farangola doble at the end of it. In between, you have titles which will appear for you to see, announcing what you're going to look at. The titles, as I say, mostly from Goya, some kind of elaborated by me. Now, I want to say a few, a few more things about the theatrical thing. Now, why are we doing it this way? Well, there are visual elements in this. Is that water? Is that water for me? It is dry here. <laughs> New Haven. New Haven, it's always wet. Um, so there's a theatrical, a very significant theatrical element in the way this works too. At the beginning of this piece, if you were to see it as it is performed, the pianist, who is a female person, in this case, Lisa Moore, comes out onto the stage alone, picks up two sticks, and doesn't play the piano. She plays uh, a xylophone. And as she's finishing, another person emerges and joins her. And the two of them are playing, one on each side of the instrument. She, as she abandons the upper side of the instrument, she moves, she's moved around once, she moves to a, a drum. And another percussionist comes out. So the effect is a visual chain of percussionists as they walk across the stage following each other. Eventually, Lisa Moore gets to the piano where she's going to stay for the piece and the chain stops. But you won't see any of that, unfortunately, because all I can show you is the other layer of the piece, which is the images and the treatment of the images from Goya, because at different points in the work, the percussionist steps on a pedal that you don't see. I mean, percussionists are always stepping on something, like a, you know, to, to hit a kick drum or something like that. So they are very rhythmic people. And when the percussionist hits that, that pedal, what happens is it triggers a filmlet to appear by computer. The filmlet turns out to be one of Goya's, the appropriate Goya image, which waxes and wanes during the course of the piece that's devoted to that idea. So if you were really there, what you would be doing is you'd be watching the percussionist, and then you'd look up and there would be this quite remarkable Goya image would appear and things would happen to it. So I was very lucky to work with a computer scientist and a visual artist who was able to take these Goya images and in a sense animate them, make something happen to them during the course of the piece. And because technology has moved to a, a kind of interesting level now, it's not a matter that somebody starts like a, a silent movie and the, the musicians have to kind of scurry to keep up with the silent movie. This is a case where the music is happening, at the appropriate moment in the music, the musician hits a trigger and the film happens, and then goes away. So you're going to see and hear eight movements, which by the way, you can, when, if you care to see this again, you can just go online, type in my name, and type in Capricho Sympaticos, Emphatic Caprices, and it will take you to this very thing that you're about to see and hear. So you can see it again if you like, free as opposed to what you're paying today. To. So it's a real bargain. Um, and um, you will also see, if you go there, a image of an actual performance as made by a different percussion group with Lisa Moore. But there was in Chicago, and there the, the, it was not really a movie, so somebody just put a camera up, like this gentleman has a camera over here now, stationary. And the screen wasn't very big, and you get the idea of what's happening, but. It's not as good as the day that Malcolm Compatello saw it here, where we had a relatively large screen and you could see everything very clearly. And it was, you know, it's better to be there, let's put it that way. So there, there are eight movements in the work. Some of them have no images whatsoever, so don't be disappointed. There'll, there'll be no images for the, for example, the, uh, the farandola simple, no images. Farandola doble at the end, no images. All the other ones have images, but they're not always there. They go away and they come back and they go away. And all of the images are by Goya. They were actually put into motion by Johanna Bresnik-Arias, who is fortunately my daughter. 
Uh, so she works very cheap, and that's uh, that's why it works really well. Uh, let's see what else I want to say. Yes. Uh, and when it's done, it's about 30 minutes long, a little longer than that. When it's done, I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about it and answer uh, questions that you might have. But before we start, is there something you're thinking about right now that I can be of some assistance with before we begin? Yes, Daniel. So why do the pictures come in and out? Just so we because they're musically timed to things that happen. Their appearance and disappearance uh, corresponds to certain things I want to show in the music. One of the things that struck me, uh, I've done another, another piece with Blake imagery uh, called For the Sexes, The Gates of Paradise that was done. That was my, my brother and sister-in-law who did that, so also very, very handy. Um, and that's a solo piano work that runs about the same length of time. But the Blake images uh, are there a lot of the time. And it's very good, but it's sometimes very difficult for audiences to concentrate simultaneously on the music and the image. And I, I write music for film, so I know what that's like. Very often when you go to the movies, you've completely forgotten if there's any music there at all, right? You come out, somebody will say to you, oh, did you hear that such and such? I always listen for it, but most listeners are not paying that much attention. So in this case, because the percussionists are so interesting to look at, I didn't want to intrude too much with the images, and the images are harsh. Um, when we come back, I will say why I think Goya's uh, images are, the people who know those images, <coughs> you know, working with them was a nightmare in some ways because they're, they're fantastic, but they're so, they're so microphone deadening <laughs> uh, that uh, they're very heartrending and uh, it's very difficult to look at them and, it, and, and I think you will, I will explain to you why I think this is such an important uh, series of images to reconnect with in our own day. Um, but I won't do that now. Yes, question? I, I'm going to feel a little limited because I won't be able to see the percussionist. Can you tell us briefly what instruments or That's what? a good point. Thank you. Yeah, so we are going to all miss part that. Of the yeah. To me. Uh, yeah, there is a, a, a xylophone, a vibraphone. There are drums of various sizes, including a very, very large bass drum. There's a grand piano. Uh, there is, uh, there are numerous little noise-making instruments, like little aquica, it goes like that kind of a sound. Then there are little that kind of a sound. And then there's a surprise sound, which I will not tell you what it is. You have to wait for that. Um, and uh, they're spread out on the stage. They're, below the line of the imagery, but they're spread out on the stage. Uh, uh, there's a special technique that I use in this work, which I want to make sure I have time to take before it runs out, but I should just say the idea of playing on both sides of an instrument, a percussion instrument, that's not a conventional Western technique. You, you know, you didn't see Lionel have to play on one side of the vibraphone, some other guy on the other side. But it turns out that the African tradition, which is known as Amadinda, it's quite common that African players will play on both sides of these mallet instruments. It makes a very complicated, interesting sound. That technique, which is very theatrical and interesting to me, which you won't see, is part of a chain of events that occurs in the work, for one thing. And it also gives rise to significant structural elements in the music, which you, you, you can't see, but you might hear. And that, if you think about it, if I, if I play on... Uh, and even on the piano part, in fact, if I play on only the white keys, it sounds like that, right? If I sit playing only the black keys, it sounds like this. But if I overlap, you can get any kind of mixture of things you want, but you have to do it very judiciously, very strategically. That's one of the other constraints. You, you'll, you'll, if we had more time, you, you would see just a, I'm a very ambitious composer for the work. I, I make a lot of demands on the music. What, what can it do? What should it do? Uh, so that in this work, for example, let me just say another thing. Don't, don't be surprised if some of this sounds a little bit like what in movies is, is called Foley. Do people know what Foley, what a Foley artist is? There's a guy who knows what a Foley artist is. Well, if you go to see a movie, uh, a great Western, say, filmed here in Monument Valley by John Ford, 
and uh, Henry Fonda and John Wayne are coming up riding on their horses. <laughs> this is what you hear. You don't actually hear sound on sound. There's no guy with a boom kind of running along trying to capture that, right? Because that's expensive, it doesn't work very well. So what would happen is they'd shoot this in silence, right? There'd be no sound. You go back to the studio and you add the horses hoof beats and the neighing and the slave. That's how they do it. I'm sorry if I'm you know, destroying all those wonderful illusions you had about that. Did you ever wonder on the rim of the Grand Canyon when somebody's, you know, you know, having a gunfight or something like that? How can they possibly record that? I mean, well, they don't, obviously. That's what they don't do. So, uh, because I have experience with this kind of business, um, you're going to see that some of these images are associated with sounds which are almost like sound effects. They're, you know, after all, percussion it goes from noise to into intoned notes. There's this range from the purely sonic disturbance of a clock crack or a, or a whistle or something like that to very precise tunes. I take advantage of all that. That's what you cannot see, but you can hear. Now, there's a role from Malcolm Compatello here, which is uh, not used to be called upon to be the musician in charge, but he will be. Because the, you can see here that, that it's the soul percussion caprichos, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven and eight. He has to actually click on them to get them to play. <laughs> So they're going to go sequentially, but we're going to depend on Malcolm's clicking ability to do this. And I'm going to be watching it very carefully. We didn't have a 12-year-old who could do this. Now we have, <laughs> and we've had no rehearsal really to speak of. So we'll see. We'll see how he does. Okay. Thank you, Malcolm. Well
some photos out there. Um, before I go into my little spiel, I want to know if there's any questions about what you just saw, just so you can clarify anything that you were thinking about that was not uh, obvious from what you just saw and heard. I'll give you the bell. Oh, that's good. That's good. Try to formulate 
histories or theories of, of things based on these short events. Whereas actually he felt that history is really better understood in terms of the long gesture. If you take a thousand years instead of five years, you can get a better sense of things. This was brought home to me very beautifully one day. I was a Rome Prize fellow staying on the steps of the American Academy and I ran into this guy named Frank Brown uh, who, uh, who was uh, doing research uh, archaeology in, in Cosa, this little town by the seaside. And there was a lot of demonstrations in Rome when I was there. And there was all sorts of upheavals. And uh, there was the compromesso historico between the, the Communist Party and the Christian Democrats was possibly coming. It was all very exciting. And uh, I asked Frank what he thought of it. And he said, you know, when I think of these matters, I try to put them in the context of Rome 2,000 years <laughs> BC. And think of it in that sense, you know. And when you look at it in that long way, uh, the individual politics of any given moment suddenly uh, are put into a different kind of perspective. Now, that's a long introduction to how I feel about Goya, and that is the sense that Goya is one of the very first to look at warfare as a witness to it. And there have been some attempts to say that Goya has a politics in the short sense of what that is. And I, I found those arguments very unconvincing. I had a big discussion with another guy who I won't name because I thought he was a dope. He was fully convinced that the left wing had falsely appropriated Goya because Goya actually wasn't such a Spanish patriot. After all, while the French were occupying Madrid, he worked for the French. And Joseph Bonaparte was a kind of patron of his, actually, briefly. But to think of Goya's politics as residing on those very moment-to-moment -moment decisions in terms of this great work of drawings that he did, this fearless observations that he subjected himself to, and in a sense allowed us to participate in by, by remembering them in this remarkable way, you have to, I think, find Goya's politics at a much deeper level. Goya's politics is extremely progressive, but it's the politics which says, I think pretty unequivocally, I'm on the side of the victim. That's my side. Mm. Want to know whose side I'm on? I'm on the side of the guy on the 3rd of May with his hands up in the air while the French firing squad shoots him. I'm on the side of the guy stuck on the tree stump, the French soldier who's been, uh, who's been decapitated or his limbs have been cut off and stuck on that. I'm on the side of the French uh, philosopher whose legs are tied together, who's having a pole shoved up his ass and being beaten by a woman. That's the person whose side I'm on. Uh, and he sees, I think, in a devastatingly clear way the, what an enormous failure war is as a human enterprise. What a dreadful failure of human imagination this is. And for that reason, you don't, in, in any victorious moment, you got to look at the defeated in some ways and see what has actually happened here. And Goya's ability to see that, I think, and to, to represent that, goes far beyond the moment-to-moment -moment politics of Spain in 1812 or 13, because it speaks to us with a freshness today that I find just devastating. And working on this piece of music, I could barely bear to look at these images, which looked like, you know, Fallujah. It looked like, uh, you know, Haifa. It looked like uh, Gaza. It looked at like it looked like any place where human beings are being torn to shreds by other human beings. And it just—it's a deeply. Uh, I mean, if there's if there's a, a politics and a moralism in there, it's pointing at us generally as a kind of species problem. That's why I think it's political. <laughs> and I think it's deeply, deeply political in that way. And uh, so, you know, trying to, you know, you, in order to do that, I, what was, like, well, you just heard, there's some very kind of funny and mis ironical, sardonic things that happen in my piece. And uh, that's to remind us that Goya, too, also saw these things in us, our, 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 that our cruelties are sometimes ironically humorous and weird. 
our perversions were very strange indeed. And uh, our ability to be both angels and devils was remarkable. Uh, and he saw this in the species. And I try in the music to capture a little of that, you know, some of the things that are so horrible uh, that they, the, the, the crushing of that piano, say, by the Fugogos, that drum line from hell in the Estragos thing. Um, is one example of that. But the, the Politicos movement, which has these kind of gustatory, flatulent sounds in there, uh, that's also part of it. I wanted to uh, embrace the, 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 the sonic spectrum of human beings in some ways, in the, in, in the way that Goya does visually. You know, it's a lot to set yourself up next to Goya, but I don't feel like competing. I'm just getting a free ride, in a way, you know, on the back of this great, great the Spanish master. I wanted to point out, too, that in some ways I feel a sense of connectedness to Goya in another way. I mean, you know, Goya, in a sense, belongs to the same bracket, if you think of it, as uh, Beethoven and Blake. These three great geniuses of European culture all lived through the French Revolution in the f highest hopes that this breakthrough of enlightenment would sweep away the clouds of reaction and of uh, obscuranticism and mysticism and silly, just silliness, you know, human cruelty and silliness. And all three of them were gravely disappointed by the outcome of that attempt. They were bitterly disappointed. And they didn't quite know what to do when the reaction came in 1815, when the revolutionaries were Napoleon was finally defeated. But even watching what happened when you tried to bring enlightenment to Spain at the end of a bayonet, Goya saw that didn't work out so well, even though it's something he deeply believed in. Beethoven, watching Napoleon suddenly turn himself from a consul of the tribune of the people into an emperor, he didn't think that was so great. Uh, Blake, uh, after supporting the French Revolution, looked at the, the terror and thought, this can't be what the ends of humanity are designed to do. And yet these three great figures uh, kept in their hearts in some special way some, some residue of that hope, of that image, even in their despair, I think. Interestingly enough, both Goy and Beethoven were deaf. Goy became deaf as a result of an illness in the 1790s. And you know, his final house was called the House of the Deaf Man, where he painted those remarkable black paintings that some of you might know. One incredible one, Saturn climbing up the head of his uh, child. Um, and they each went into a kind of inner or outer emigration. You know, Beethoven, in the sitting around the cafes of Vienna, was, was kind of spied on continuously by Metternich's secret police in Vienna. And they let him go because they thought he was insane. They thought he was just a crazy old poop. And he was a very famous composer, and what was the point of locking him up? They'd make a lot of trouble. So they let him sit in these beauty's cafes and talk about, you know, Schiller and the Ode to Joy and Freedom and Brotherhood and all these things. They let him, let him rave on, they thought. Goya had to actually, in the, in the end, he, he couldn't really stay in Spain. You know, he died in France and was buried in Bordeaux. Uh, he came back a couple of times, but this political situation was dreadful, and he couldn't continue to work in, that, in his own home, in his own country, so he, he physically emigrated. And then you have the great Blake, who, who also it, it couldn't bear it. What, and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's? It was the Jerusalem build it here among these dark satanic mills, asks Blake. Couldn't quite believe it, and he immigrates sort of inside into his religious, mystical, transformative sense. Now, Malcolm and I and others are from my generation, we didn't, we didn't quite have the revolution in 68, 69 that they had in 1789, but somehow I felt a certain commonality while our hopes of that era we waited so long. How long? How long? But you can always write music, you can always paint pictures, and you can always make poetry. That's all I have to say. <laughs>
it's a kind of irresolute resolution, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, this kind of mad dance starts to happen, which for me is the summation of the whole Farang, Farandol. Uh, if you think about it, the Farandol in La Lisienne is actually, the Farandol originally musically was a 6 8. So it's yeah, the, 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 and in my piece it's 6 8, but it's subdivided in a very complicated way. So you, sometimes you hear it as two groups of three, sometimes you hear it as three groups of two. And then it's a groups of fives. It's all very complicated, but at the very end of the piece, it kind of goes out of its mind and it kind of freezes. And then that last little, you know, part sounds and then it's the piece. So. Um, how life is in a way, isn't it? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a resolution or not. I, I think it's, I think, it, I think, I hope something that Goya might have liked. Um, you know, he has that wonderful picture of this, of this witch holding this child. You ever see this? It's called Wind or something like that, and the child is uh, lighting a candle from his rectum. You know, you know, well, have a look at it sometime. I, I, believe me, it's there. Uh, oh yeah, and I was going to read something to you. I thought this was absolutely insane when I found this. Uh, here's Goya from his last drawings. He gave them little subtitles. Here's some of them that he gave to the last group. This is when he's uh, in his uh, exile, or really about to be completely exiled. Uh, he gives them, he says, um, uh, many similar, uh, Goya's drawing, he has a picture, there's a picture here of a man being tortured. I know where think of that coming from now. I can't understand why he's thinking that. So the man is hauled up by a pulley, his hands fastened behind his back. There are similar drawings that depict human beings twisted into impossible shapes and being fettered and closed in stocks or fastened to frames and racks. Sometimes the drawings also refer to <laughs> contemporary episodes of torture or punishment and bear brief and laconic captions such as for being a liberal. It is better to die what cruelty for discovering the movement of the earth, for marrying whom she wished, for speaking a different language, for being Jewish. This is Goya. So yeah, so I don't know what I'm saying. I, I don't know if that answers the complete question, but uh, it's a kind of a. It's a yeah, there was another question over here. Yeah. I, I just have to ask you this question. Uh, the opening scene of Bird After Greeting. Did you write the part for the drums? From Burn After Reading? Cohen Brothers, Bird After Reading. As you see the opening scene, you're up in the sky and you're coming down to the earth. And it's very similar to. Oh, well, I like the Cone Brothers a lot, but I don't, I don't recall that, actually. I didn't like that as much as the other one that they did after about the guy in Minnesota who, uh, <laughs> I forget the title of that one. What is it called? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, he's a school teacher. He, uh, he's teaching uh, physics, and he, uh, uh, well, never mind. It's a whole other thing. I don't know that one so well. It's very yeah. similar to what you uh, Well, it, it, you know, puerile, infantile minds work in the same general <laughs> way. You know, it could be said at the highest level and at the lowest level. Other, 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 other questions or observations about this? I hope someday that you will, first of all, the, this will be issued as a, an EP uh, on, on a digital disc, which you will be able to purchase and put some shoes on my grandson Joaquin's feet. I'd like you to do that. Um, uh, and um, it will, the sound quality will be great. I mean, it's what you heard, but really at the really high level sound quality. Unfortunately, we don't have the funds yet to, to put together with the, with the images of it. So you can look at them, you know, you can play it while looking at it on the, on the computer. Yes? What's your next project? Uh, well, I just finished two projects um, in quick succession. The one was, um, uh, a piece for two percussionists. I don't know if Michael's involved in this or not, but a, a bunch of percussionists that in America got together as a group to commission me, and I, they wanted a piece for two it's two players who speak. Uh, and I, I, you know, my my scripture is Kafka. You know, whenever I feel the need to a spiritual connection, I 
I read about a cockroach or something, something that really, you know, gets into me. Uh, and so this is called A Message from the Emperor to Percussionist Play, a wonderful story. Uh, then I did another piece of oboe quartet uh, called Going Home. Uh, it's about, uh, well, it's, it has, I won't even say what it's about, but it's an interesting work. And now I'm actually, I'm following my, my, my colleague Dan Asia's thing, and I'll be working on an opera. I, I the dramatic club, so I've been to, you know, but I, yeah, and it's actually going to be based on something from Chekhov, which, uh, <laughs> which I think is a good place to, for any, uh, anybody who's thinking about the human condition to uh, have a good look. He, he's a little bit like Goya in the sense that he, he also, he judges and does not judge. His judgment is grand and, and wide, but not individual. And he looks at a social, uh, a social problem and he doesn't say, that's the bad guy, and that's the good guy. He says, look at this social problem and watch these people trying to make their way through it and how, how badly they do. More questions or observations? <laughs> I just want to go on record as saying I can now put on my CD that I played with Martin <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think now you should, should more say, I toyed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming and thank you for